You're watching The Flourishing Introvert Show. If you're an introvert with more to offer and are looking for ways to play to your strengths authentically, you're in the right place. With up to 50% of any population identifying as an introvert, if you're not one, you'll know one, but you may not understand what makes them tick. Watching this show will help you to build that understanding and consequently build better business and personal relationships. Many people don't find out until their mid-years that what makes them different is their introversion. So this show is also for you if you're curious about becoming the best version of yourself. Let's get started. Well, hello and welcome along to the Flourishing Introvert Show. Come on in, make yourself comfortable and join me as I share some recent discomfort with you. No, this isn't about me being negative, but it is about me being honest about the realities of life. No one said it was always easy and I don't pretend that life as a small business owner is all roses either. So what we're looking at this week is can introverts balance fulfillment with easy living? Now, for those of you who've not joined me before, I'm Joanna Rawbone, the founder of Flourishing Introverts, and I'm on a mission to shift the extroversion bias so that people can own their introversion with confidence, with pride and a lived experience of equity. And we're a long way from that right now. I work with introverts who want to reach more of their potential, and I rattle the cages of organizations and educational establishments to shake out the extroversion bias that's usually hiding in plain sight. And it's often that bias that actually makes life more difficult for us. Anyway, I was feeling stuck, the kind of stuck where I felt like I was trying to wade through treacle. And when that happens, I get tired pretty quickly and I feel my spirits dip. I'm sure it kind of feels like, you remember the peaks and valleys of life that we talked about last week and a few weeks before that? It certainly feels like I'm on the downward slope into those valleys. And there are a lot of things for me that contribute to that stuckness, that treacly feeling for me. It can be the weather. And certainly here in the UK, the weather has not been kind. We haven't had the warm spring weather that we're often blessed with. My health can contribute towards that. And it is closely aligned with the weather. I used to do a lot of work in the Middle East, and it was always such a joy to me to get out there every two, every six weeks to two months just to get my top up of vitamin D. Doesn't happen anymore, certainly not since the pandemic. And of course, there's another contributor to the way I feel when things are sticky, when they're heavy going, and that's my pesky inner critic. Gladys, if you've not been introduced to her before, for Gladys is the name of my inner critic seems to have a knack of knowing when I'm feeling just the insiest bit vulnerable or uncertain. And as soon as she cottons onto that, she's in my ear like a flash. Talk about an annoying earworm that's really hard to get rid of. Anyway, I've noticed that the more difficult things feel, the more tired I feel. Possibly not alone with that. And the more tired I feel, the lower my energy for getting unstuck is. And the lower my energy, the less inclined I am to strive, to push through, to make sure that I honour my intentions. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways, certainly a vicious circle rather than a, a virtuous one. And at times like this, I find myself thinking, why don't I just jack it all in and retire, potter? And I don't mean crafting potter, I mean just pottering around because I'm a very good potterer and I love pottering around. 
So on one level, I love the idea of spending the rest of my life pottering. And yet at another level, I know it just wouldn't be enough. Why? Because of that purpose of mine, that purpose I have to shift the extroversion bias, to free introverts from the chains of, of um, I suppose, collaboration, of compliance. I have quite a few friends who are around my, about my age, all of whom have actually retired. And of course, they keep asking me, when am I going to retire? And the reality is I have bags of knitting wool waiting to be started and patterns that I can't wait to get stuck into. And if I'm honest, I have a few half started or started half finished garments on the knitting needles. I have a garden that's crying out for some attention. If only it would stop raining. And I have crafting courses that I really want to sign up to. I'm a big fan of Richard Bertinet and his bread making methods. And Richard runs a course down near Bath. And Bath is a beautiful city in the southwest of, of England. And I would love to go down there and do a, a bread making course. But I don't. Because I'm too busy attending to my purpose. Anyway, when this happened to me again recently, this sticky stuckness feeling, a bracing walk along the seafront on an ozone filled blustery day was enough to energize me for the trip back up the other side of the valley, out back onto neutral ground. But of course, you know what happens when we get to neutral ground. We look ahead and what we see are more peaks. And more peaks require just as much effort. But I console myself with the fact that at least the view from their summit would be more inspiring from the bottom of the valley. And remember that inspiring piece because it becomes late, important, I think, later on. So guess what? That question re-emerged for me again this week, just this week, when I was on the level looking up at the peaks. I just worked with a room full of 50 and 60 somethings who, who were unemployed and they were part of a pro bono program about helping them get back into the workplace. And they were struggling to think of the roles that they wanted to do next that aligned with their purpose. And I don't know if it's something to do with that age range, that age group, but many of them had not considered what they wanted to do with their life, what their purpose was. It seemed to be more about that was what was expected of me or that's how I spent my career. So it makes sense to try and get back into that again, rather than thinking afresh about what their purpose was. And then there are the reports about the gender equality um, divide and, and pay um, gap widening again, which is such bad news for society because here in the UK, certainly women are not well represented in leadership positions. And to cap it all, I read an article in the Sunday Times magazine called Meet Generation F it. F star, 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 it. Star, 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 it. So you know what they're talking about. And this was an article about the youngsters who are bold enough to just step away from their jobs, step away from the jobs that don't stimulate them, that don't appear to be matching their purpose, away from organisations that don't value them, away from countries that don't inspire them. There's that inspire word again. And my challenge with those that younger generation is that if they're going to step away from, and I can understand why they do, I wished I'd had the courage maybe earlier in my career, but if they're going to step away from the challenges rather than change things from within, 
then who is going to change them? Because the reality is that the older generations technically are part of the problem. We're not always part of the solution. We need that young, fresh thinking to shake us out of our slumber and get us thinking about new ways of doing business. And now for me, here was this question again. Why don't I just take life easy? And it's a great question. Why don't I? I said that actually one of the reasons I don't is my purpose. And so what I realized is it's time for me to practice what I preach, time for some self-observation, some purposeful reflection, and maybe some shifting of mindset, shifting of attitudes, shifting of literally my energy. And because I'm something of an open book, I thought, why not share my process with you, warts and all? I'm not going to share the ins and outs necessarily of my findings from the process, but I thought, why not share my process with you? The practice that I engage here, and actually my practice of choice, and, and I do think this has something to do with my um, with my introversion, is self or includes self-observation. It's not entirely self-observation, but it includes self-observation. And I've known from an early age that I have an ability to distance myself from me, to detach. And I remember as a younger person thinking there was something wrong with me because I was able to do that. And since I've realized actually it's a gift to be able to do that. Because I can be both the observer and the observed at the same time in a way. And this ability probably helps with me being able to take in what neurolinguistic programming terms would be called that third perceptual position. Because if the first possession position is my direct experience of me, so I'm in my body looking out at the world through my own eyes, processing the world through my values, my beliefs, my emotions, through my own map of the world. And the second position is where I'm standing perceptually in another person's shoes. So it's a position of empathy. And I can see the world through their perspective, from their needs, desires, emotions, their map of the world. And the third position for me is kind of similar to that self-observation because it's that detached position where I can be a neutral observer noticing without the emotional involvement, without the emotional attachment. And this is absolutely invaluable to me when I know that I need to step back and get insights on me, my how I'm behaving in situations, on what's going on for me. In this case, why I'm stuck. My principle and business principle and personal value of purposeful curiosity comes in really useful here, as I'm always eager to understand more about myself and get the insights, especially when what I think I need to do is upgrade in some way. And that may sound like a strange term, but for me, the more I'm growing and developing, it does feel like I'm upgrading up leveling perhaps in some way. I'm not quite sure what the right term is, but certainly that's how it feels to me. And in order to be able to practice self-observation, I think of it almost like watching an animal in the wild. And if we're going to do that successfully, I think we need the three S's, space, stillness, and silence. Certainly, if we're observing animals, kind of, you know, being raucous or making a lot of noise is not going to help us observe them in their natural habitat. So whilst these three may minimise the observer effect, whereby just being watched kind of changes the behaviour, it takes much more discipline to 
observe myself and not change just because I'm observing myself. It's hard not to get caught in a loop here, but it's, it is a fascinating pro process. You know, remember the Hawthorne effect where employees in a, in a business, more of a kind of production line, were observed. And as they were being observed, their productivity increased purely because they were being observed. You know, they would change the lighting up and down and whatever change they made because they were knew, knew they were being observed, their productivity increased. So our behavior often does change when we know we're being observed. But the idea here is to observe objectively <laughs> as far as possible and then decide if changes might be advantageous. What would I be observing, though? Well, I'm observing my thoughts as the silence enables me to hear my inner thoughts, to hear the meaning I'm making of what is happening around me and to notice patterns in my thinking. So silence is incredibly important for that. And it's one of the reasons that as an introvert, I need silence, not just to do my best work productively, but to do my best work reflectively as well. I'm also observing behaviors. You know, where am I merely reacting to things and where am I taking that pause that Viktor Frankl talks about? And so in that pause, I choose my response. So where am I taking the pause in order to choose an appropriate response as opposed to merely reacting? And I'm also observing my emotions, noticing where I feel them in my body and then attempting to identify what those emotions are. I've talked to before, I know, about the fact that my generation, I certainly feel somewhat emotionally illiterate. You know, up until probably even eight years ago, I could probably talk quite openly and identify quite easily when I was happy, when I was sad, when I was angry. And then I kind of ran out of words. I ran out of emotions. And I've talked about this on a previous show. And the resource that I refer to when I'm still developing my emotional literacy is I refer, refer to Brené Brown's Places We Go category from her research that she captured, captured in her book, Atlas of the Heart. And I find those such useful categories. And maybe the one that I'm particularly drawn to, certainly I have been this time round, is places I go to self-assess, which might be, in her words, pride, hubris or humility. Now, much of this sounds like what we'd probably now think of as mindfulness, doesn't it? And, and mindfulness seems to be a more recent thing that many of us have become aware of. But by observing myself in this way, I'm giving myself the best kind of attention. Because I'm showing myself that I care about me. I'm showing myself that I care about my emotions, about my behavior, about my thoughts. I'm interested in who I am. I'm interested in who I'm becoming. And I'm not afraid to see myself, warts and all. And that's where another of my business principles come in, because I know I need to be quietly gutsy to see all of me, the good, the bad and the ugly. If you've not practiced self-observation -observa before, there are some basic steps that, um, that I follow that you might find useful to follow too. The first thing to do is to find a quiet and comfortable place where you can be alone and undisturbed for a while. Because remember the environment in which we do this the best 
requires that space, the silence and the stillness. And then it's about deciding what you'll be observing. So there are times where I choose, am I observing my thoughts, my feelings, my bodily sensations, my behavior? And there are also times where I just tune in to myself to see what attracts my attention, what demands my attention. And there's a word of warning that comes here, <clears throat> because if I purely rely on that, chances are I'm resisting looking at something I don't want to look at, observing something I don't want to observe. So sometimes choosing in advance what to observe is more important rather than tuning into what's calling my attention. Then it's about observing without judgment. And this is tough. So simply noticing what is happening, including any resistance, without judging it as right or wrong, good or bad, but just being open and curious about what I'm observing so that I really get to know it, so that I become familiar with it. And then it's about finding descriptive language, you know, the objective, the factual language that helps me describe in detail what I'm observing. And that descriptive, factual, objective language helps me avoid interpreting or analyzing my observations, because otherwise what I'm doing is getting back into my head in some ways and doing that whole thing about making sense of things. Actually, what I not just need to do is hold lightly the observations I'm making. And in this process, it's important to stay present, you know, a bit like meditation. When our mind wanders, as it will, it's about gently bringing it back to the present moment so that we can continue observing. And being the engineer by background that I am, where my mind usually wanders in, is into analysis. I want to understand why I kind of go, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Rather than just sitting and holding lightly the observation. And then, then it's about reflecting on those observations. So after we've, or after I finished that process, it's then about taking time to reflect on what I've noticed. What did I learn about myself? What did I learn about my stuckness in this case? How can I use that knowledge to make positive changes, to get unstuck? And in fact, do I want to do anything with the insights or are they just insights? Does anything need to be done? Or is it just that I've made some observations that I'm now aware of? Through that self-observation process, I can be a resource to myself. I can get to understand better where I'm getting in my own way, where I'm making things unnecessarily difficult or complex, where I'm choosing the path to the valleys rather than to the peaks, where I'm laying a trail of sticky treacliness before me and then wondering why I'm getting stuck as I'm wading through it. You know, as introverts, we're very good, I think, at being in our heads and overthinking things. And this self-observation gives me a way to be more in my body whilst observing what's going on. So what I found from my practice, and I'm not going to share all the kind of all the stuff with you. But I, I was able to rediscover my inspiration. There's that word again. And reconnect with my purpose. I didn't know I was disconnected. But in observation, I realized I had disconnected and was that due to the tiredness or was the tiredness due to the fact I disconnected? 
You know, I, I can't achieve the mission I have to shift the bias and to liberate introverts from that life of compliance without my purpose and without inspiration. And I know I'm not yet ready to walk away from my mission. My work is not done. My reach is not broad enough. There are not yet enough people doing this work alongside me, with and for me, that I can step away yet. So I have much to do still. And frankly, pottering whilst appealing, and it is incredibly appealing to me, it is probably only self-serving, maybe even egocentric to think about pottering. Whereas achieving my purpose, my mission, living a fulfilled life combines serving self with serving others. And just this morning, I recorded a, a webinar for a big um rebellion, introvert rebellion conference that's being held and hosted in Australia, where I was talking about why introverts make such great leaders. And part of that is around the willingness to be a servant leader and the willingness to lead from within the pack rather than think we have to stride out front and kind of tally-ho with the troops behind us. No, we empower those around us and enable them to shine. So pottering feels like an easy life, but with little purpose to me. A fulfilled life feels purposeful, so maybe, yeah, less easy, but more rewarding. And Less easy is not the same, I noticed, as dis-ease. <laughs> and personally, I think that sometimes easy and dis-ease go together in terms of, you know, choosing an unfulfilled life. And you might remember from an earlier show, those three enduring factors of fulfillment that I still refer to. The first being that unfolded self and life, and I still love that phrase, which is the extent to which any of us can pursue projects that personally matter. And I know I've got people watching here today with projects that personally matter to them and through which they're able to be their unique selves and lead true lives. The second of the enduring factors is a worthwhile life so that we can actually invest and use our own capacities meaningfully. We're not wasting them. And the third is positive impact and legacy, doing something that matters to other and leaving something of value. And those three enduring factors of a fulfilled life are mighty for me right now. I find I keep coming back to them. And I encourage you to all unfold into a worthwhile life that leaves behind value. The business strategist Peter Stroppel defines my kind of legacy best when he says that legacy is not leaving something for people, it's leaving something in people. And I get quite emotional when I think about that because I'm not wanting to leave behind, you know, some, some necessarily some great body of work that people refer to. What I am intending to do is leave behind that sense of fulfillment and flourishing within introverts who choose that path. So if you feel you have some unfolding still to do as you build your worthwhile life, then why not book a call with me to explore what you might need? And if you want to know how to do that, then quite simply, either 
the link that's at the bottom of the screen there, quiet flourishing introvert, quiet flourishing introverts.com forward slash call will get you into my calendar where you can book a free 30 minute call with me just to explore how you might need to unfold. And you can e email me as always on joanna at flourishingintroverts.com. And of course, you can check out all the resources I have on my website, which is flourishingintroverts.com. But for now, thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing your flourishing path. And I really encourage you to take to make the right choice because ultimately the choice is yours easy or fulfilled unfolded or bound purposeful or aimless and there's no judgment in any of those choices informed choice is what matters but thank you for joining me <laughs>